Okay, hello everybody and welcome to Talking Heads number two, the SCMR GEM series uh, from the Sussex Centre of Migration Research, where we're giving people the opportunity to talk about their articles that they've written and post short um, podcasts about uh, why they did what they did and why it's interesting and why you should read it. Um, today's talk, I'm Paul Statham, a director of the Sussex Centre for Migration Research, by the way, and I'm, as usual, giving this talk from Living Room Central, um, which is my current location most of the time. But um, yeah, anyway, today's talk, we're going to be talking about uh, borders, states and how states make borders. And uh, today I'm going to introduce uh, Nick Ostrand, who is a postdoctoral research fellow at Sussex and the other author of the paper is yours truly. Um, you can see there the link for uh, looking at the various talks that we have and hopefully we're going to be putting some more up soon. So uh, today what we're going to talk about is agency beyond remote control. As you can see, we have a rather lovely picture of a border there, and one suspects that the way that border has pl played out has been slightly less lovely. Um, but yes, today then the talk is about borders and how states make efforts to put borders beyond their own territorial uh, sovereignty and how that works. And so what we wanted to do in this article was to talk about extraterritorial migration management. And the impetus of the article is that really um, we've reached a stage where it's necessary to go beyond ideas of remote control. And uh, Zolberg's famous and influential metaphor in a way has become the standard for looking at this type of research. So uh, states extraterritorial efforts for uh, remote control, which means putting borders up in other countries' territories. And um, it really is looking at their efforts and practices to control mobility outside their own sovereign territory. Um, you know, this is necessary from their perspective to filter who can pass, but also to determine what is quite often thought of as unwanted forms of migration. Now, um, the idea of immigration control that um, is underpinned by the idea of remote control uh, works very much from the idea of migration flowing from the global south to the global north. It's a perspective that was developed in that kind of uh, framework. And it's been a very powerful and long-standing metaphor um, and way of seeing the world in these perspectives on immigration control. Um, but whatever the insights it brought, I think it's probably fair to say that um, at least from our perspective, we see it as a, a metaphor that really belonged to the analog world. And in a world that's undergone considerable globalization, it, it's, um, you know, perhaps the difference between analog and digital is, uh, is where the metaphors should be moving and that the greater speed and movement of things and the interrelatedness of the world now compared to when it was 30 years ago makes us, you know, brings us to a position where perhaps it's necessary to reassess what remote control means and whether it's useful and um, or whether the world has actually moved on and uh, we need to look at uh, immigration in another way. In a sense, I guess what we're saying is that academic thinking has been uh, rather path dependent and tended to follow uh, the initial very insightful tra trajectory that it started on. So this idea of remote control, and we're all uh, used to sitting in our armchairs pushing buttons, so we're used to that kind of idea, we understand what it means. And the good things about metaphors is that they're quite often simple to understand, but perhaps it also gives a rather oversimplistic view of uh, the way that states try to put uh, immigration controls beyond their own borders. 
And there are some sort of implications built into the idea of remote control. First of all, the only actor who matters is the one sat in their armchair pushing the button, which of course leads to a overfocus and an on the destination state in the global north as being uh, the source of all energy, action and power in determining what happens. It also gives the impression that once the liberal state from the global north desires some form of immigration control, that that's kind of easily on, imposed on other places and relatively easily achieved. Another um, thing is that perhaps then um, you know, the outcomes, you know, which channel you pick is determined by the button pushers preferences. And so without wishing to overstretch this, I think it's important then that we start to think about um, extraterritorial migration management or migration control in ways that at least um, challenges some of the implications in there that um, in our perspective don't really fit the, the way that uh, remote control or immigration controls beyond borders work today. First of all, it's important in moving beyond remote control to start to think about global interconnectedness of the nation state system of extraterritorial migration management. Um, people, authors such as David Fitzgerald talk about uh, shared coercion of movement. So it's not really the case that global uh, north states are acting on their own any, any longer or, or that uh, you know, they're able to determine what they do. They also interact with other states that are more powerful than them or of a similar power and those arrangements can be institutionalized. So we need therefore to move a little bit away from this idea of bilateral relationships. Also, um, remote control offshore actions shouldn't really be considered, you know, when remote control came in, it was seen as kind of a novel addition to uh, the immigration controls that were happening at borders. But I think it's important these days to see it as a, as an integrated part of, it, of the immigration control apparatus and that it's not really, uh, it's not really separable from other aspects of immigration control. It's very much part and central to the same system. You know, the same uh, small doors that Zolberg, Zolberg talked about in the walls that are, are built there. And so, then we need to start then thinking not only about the world beyond remote control, but also doing research that can study certain aspects of that. And, um, you know, I've already alluded to the uh, bias on the global north and the perspective working from the global north destination state, as it's seen, although we know that migration can, can go in many different directions. Um, and so, simply then to try and get away from this destination state bias, um, it's important to look at other potential forms of agency. For example, foreign states shouldn't simply be seen as takers of uh, whatever global North states that will, will in most cases be more powerful, but it's not the case that foreign states don't have any pushback in these kind of arrangements or procedures. So it's all important to see them as agents. And then there are the people who are posted abroad to implement these, these kind of activities of remote control liaison officers. Again, these are people who have agency and have to work on the ground and the social world can be a messy place where it's not easy to determine what's happening. And you know, perhaps they know more about what's going on there than people back in uh, Westminster or London and the home office. And then also, there are foreign officials on the ground who may or may not want to work with their counterparts. And that can also be a form of agency that can very much shape the outcomes. So um, Nick shortly is going to talk about the kind of research we've done uh, in looking at other forms of agency uh, beyond the Home Office that shape aspects of immigration control and their outcomes. I think it's also important in moving beyond the remote control bilateral ideas that it's just a relationship between one state and another state um, to take on board the global interconnectedness 
of the world and immigration controls more seriously. And to do that um, in our research, we put forward a uh, comparative approach taking uh, five different countries, Ghana, Egypt, Thailand, the United States and France. And in that way, um, also taking state, uh, states from the global north, because although um, we're, the research is primarily on the UK, it's also the case that there are liaison activities both in the US and France, even though France is part of the European Union. So it's important to actually look at what's going on in the world. And um, yeah, the, the reason then and the rationale behind this paper was that there was a feeling that that um, you know, research had become kind of trapped in its own dependent way, path dependent way of looking at the world and people had perhaps stopped looking a little bit beyond um, what was going on in the world and that then these kind of the remote con control cliche, although it may have been accurate at some time in the past, simply became some kind of self-fulfilling prophecy. Another point to make is that one of the reasons that people don't study what liaison officers do abroad is that it's a very uh, difficult thing to do, not least because their activities are shrouded in secrecy uh, by the Home Office and that therefore in the past there's been a tendency uh, for researchers simply to focus on what they can see, so the policies that are written and what um, you know, what the Home Office says it does in its own documents, but then not looking beyond that and looking at the, uh, the process of implementation and what actually happens on the ground, that of course, it can be the decisive thing in shaping action, uh, in shaping both actions and outcomes of those kind of remote controls. So now I'm going to pass on to Nick, who's going to inform you in greater detail about the type of research that we've undertaken. Great, thanks Paul. Um, and so our research focuses on the UK's immigration liaison network. So what is the UK's immigration liaison network? And really this network is made up of civil servants posted to foreign jurisdictions who evaluate conditions on the ground, provide information and help enforce the UK's visa system and immigration goals often by working with airlines and local immigration and police officials to stem unwanted movement. And so this network is really a key but relatively hidden tool in the UK's effort to control migration. In 2015, there were just under 190 immigration liaison officers working in 45 cities in 36 countries. And so while the Home Office provides generalized statements about the network overall, they are very secretive about specific details and work on what actually happens on the ground. And so this secrecy, as Paul mentioned, and challenges in accessing information about officials working in foreign countries is really likely one of the reasons why it's so rare to have a detailed study on immigration liaison officers and why there's little focus on implementation of extraterritorial migration control in general. And so this really brings out one key strength of our paper, which is original and rare empirical material that we use, which includes interviews with mid and street level home office officials who had direct experience working abroad. We also made around 15 original freedom of information requests to support our interviews and carried out extensive documentary research on official public documents as well as job advertisements for UK immigration officers, which helped us get a sense of what officials are expected to do in specific countries. And we think this was kind of a useful and unique way of getting at information that wasn't provided in policy documents. And so unsurprisingly to most of you, finding and obtaining this original material was very difficult. Uh, we spent countless hours trying to access interviews with Home Office officials. We had to repeatedly follow up with the Home Office on our freedom of information requests and often challenge the resistance to provide very basic information about what the liaison network was doing. In one case, for example, the Home Office even refused to provide historical data on a number of immigration, on the number of immigration liaison officers working in each country from 10 years ago, which I think is really emblematic of the secrecy around their operations. And so access to this important that was previously not available in public domain allowed us to really go beyond existing literature, which has relied almost exclusively on public policy documents and interviews with high 
workplace civil servants. And this was really important because it enabled us to take into account the social world of local conditions and on the ground relationships. And thus illustrate how these factors influence the UK's extraterritorial migration management. So it lets us see where key decisions and actions take place that are not the exclusive remit of a destination state government operating from within, when it, within its own sovereign territory. Or in other words, we found actions in the social world outside the UK's jurisdiction and beyond their control have substantial bearing on the UK's extraterritorial management. And so we really focus on two actor fields and agency at two levels, at the interstate level and the street level. Um, and before I go on to talk about those, I just briefly want to pick up on where Paul left off in talking about our case studies and why we think they're so important. And so we selected Ghana, Egypt, Thailand, the US and France to really expand this conceptual lens and get away from the classic remote control bilateral case studies, which kind of are cliche kind of um, narratives about more powerful states in the global north exporting control to less powerful states in the south. And our, our range of case studies allow us to investigate this and show how it's really more complicated where there's extraterritorialization efforts that also occur between powerful states who have more or less equal relationships. And these cases also importantly allow us to consider variations across region, degree of political interconnectedness, historical and cultural ties, economic development and interdependency. And this enabled us to then investigate how these different state level dynamics relate to conditions on the ground and street level interactions in the social world. And these comparisons also really gave rise to some unexpected findings. Um, in France, for example, despite the very high level of institutional cooperation through the EU and general common goals over immigration, we also find that there are sometimes competing interests where states are trying to shift burden about who's responsible for what they see as unwanted migrants. And we even had home office officials believe that some French personnel working at regional airports were quote unquote, turning a blind eye to unauthorized migrants leaving the country because they really preferred them to be in Britain rather than in France. And so this just illustrates the complexity um, in these narratives. Also, I think the fact that the UK has immigration liaison officers in countries like the US, France and Thailand may be surprising given that research often focuses on these key sending and transit states such as Libya, Morocco and Turkey. So once again, we really wanted to expand this narrative and look more closely at what's going on. And so at the interstate level, contrary to this image of remote control, we found that the UK is highly dependent on these other countries to carry out its overseas immigration controls uh, and achieve their goals. And so this gives the foreign states considerable power and agency to shape and push back on the UK's efforts. And so one good example of this is Egypt where despite allowing immigration officers in the country, the government essentially refused to cooperate on any immigration and border enforcement activities, which really stymied what immigration liaison officers were able to do in the country. And so as one official put it, if you're not actually working with the people, the local authorities, no one is taking the forged documents or looking at the crime groups behind what's going on. There are no consequences and nothing to deter them from trying again. And so here we really see a good example of how foreign states are not just takers of the UK's extraterritorial policies, but they're pushing back and shaping the UK's efforts. And in other countries like Ghana and the US, you know, there's much higher levels of willingness to cooperate at the governmental level. Yet even in these situations, these countries are still exerting their interest and agency in the relationship with the UK. And so at a general macro level, we find that the relative motivation to work with the UK often relates to specific pre-existing pre international relations, such as participation in intergovernmental institutions, um, historical ties like being part of the Commonwealth, as well as economic inter interdependency, including things like trade, tourism, and aid, and perceived mutual benefits from cooperation. And so this context is really important because it shapes these opportunity structures for cooperation over migration management too. 
uh, occur. Despite the importance of this interstate level, what happens in practice is really highly contingent on local actors and conditions on the ground. And so this brings us to really one of the most important contributions of our paper, which is the significance of this street level agency in actions. Um, and so first of all, we found UK officers have considerable <clears throat> autonomy and discussion in decisions and actions on foreign soil. They're not simply carrying out instructions by the central home office, but they have authority to de develop strategies and respond to on the ground experiences and conditions as they arise. Importantly, they also gather interpret intelligence and provide analyses and assessments of efficacy on the ground, which then feeds back into the home office's perceptions of immigration risk and also policy decisions. And so one example of this, is a new restrictive transit visas that were introduced for Syrians and Libyans and Egyptians in 2012, which was based in large part on information provided by liaison officers. So in, a, so in essence, uh, immigration liaison officers positions abroad and interactions with foreign officials gives them a really kind of unique and powerful insight into information that's not available to home office officials working within the UK. And so this, subsequent, this information subsequently shapes policymaking and enforcement priorities. And so we think this feedback loop is a really important and original finding that in some ways is counterintuitive. Certainly influences running in the opposite direction uh, to that implied by remote control metaphors. It is also um, kind of goes in contrast to what we think in terms of policy implementation, where they're just acting out decisions made within the home office. At the same time, immigration liaison officers positions in foreign jurisdictions <clears throat> means that they don't have a formal authority and thus must rely on soft power persuasion to try to achieve their goals. In the fact, they're must adjust their strategic aims to be reconciled with local context and constraints in a given country, especially the relative willingness of foreign officials to cooperate with them. And so in Thailand, despite the existence of a formal agreement that allows UK officers to share intelligence with Thai police, with the goal that the police would then use this information to investigate, arrest, and prosecute individuals and groups suspected of being involved in unauthorized migration, we found that this almost never happens. And so officials explained this by saying that Thai officials are not really interested and don't really care who's leaving the country. And the UK didn't have enough power in that country or social capital to persuade them to do otherwise. Yet in other countries like Ghana, France, and the US where there's generally much more willingness to work together, we find that even in these situations, liaison officers activities are the product of negotiations and compromises with local counterparts. <clears throat> and so one official put this nicely by saying, we work and build relationships in a country, but they also work with us. In fact, I think it's a two way street. So this is really illustrating the co-constitutive process of what's going on, um, which is being shaped by immigration officials from the UK working in a foreign country as well as their foreign counterparts. And so I think really a key takeaway message is that implementation is a messy process where outcomes on the ground rather than being established or controlled by the home office in the UK are really open to happen chance and serendipity and that they result from officers ability to build quality relationships and social capital uh, with their counterparts as well as other uncontrollable and unintended unanticipated conditions like the local capacity and domestic interests of foreign officials. And I'm going to stop there. Okay, thanks a lot, Nick, for presenting the main, you know, some of the key findings and points from our research. I guess to wrap up, basically what we're trying to do is, um, you know, to present a perspective that's a counterbalance and challenge some of the core assumptions that have been present in this uh, literature. Um, you know, quite a few claims in the remote control perspectives are that uh, policy outcomes are seen sometimes as almost a semi-automatic result of what the Home Office is doing in the UK. And I think we, you know, 
at the very least, such claims are exaggerated and, and they could even you know, well be false. And against this, what we want to try and put forward is the idea that these policy outcomes are rather messy and that they occur in the social world. They tend to be a result of a very long chain of decisions by foreign actors as well as UK actors uh, representing the state and, and operating at different institutional levels, which again brings in um, you know, feedback mechanisms and complexity that make outcomes difficult to control. And important within this overall framework, we think, is the street level in, on foreign soil. So what actually happens between liaison officers, whether they get on with their counterparts, whether they are able to establish even friendships. So, you know, this kind of street level bureaucracy um, is something that's very little discussed, but we think that it actually has an impact on the outcomes and ends up that these people are the ones who are feeding back the key information that shapes the UK's policies and actions in this field of um, immigration. So, you know, in a way, I guess what we're saying is that in events in the social world are open to factors that are beyond the Home Office's control, even though there's a very strong discourse about always being in control about immigration. And so in the end, uh, plenty of the policy outcomes actually end up being remote from the state's initial intention, intentions. Then um, regarding research, future research, I think that researchers need to move beyond taking what states say they do publicly over immigration at face value, particularly with regard to the control. States and home offices and politicians like bigging up their talk about being in control of everything. And those, and I think we need to bear in mind that those positions are quite often made within the context of domestic politics or being tough on immigration and all those kind of things and uh, that they're not actually necessarily a reflection of what's going on in the social world, which as our research has shown, tends to be a much more messy en enterprise, and that maybe researchers need to move beyond taking what uh, politicians and governments and the home offices say they do about immigration at face value and start uh, building the academic picture up more from what's going on in the social world. Thank you very much for joining us for this second uh, SCMR Gems Talking Heads. Thanks for Nick for her presentation and thank you to you for joining us. Uh, Paul Statham, Director of the Sussex Centre for Migration Research. Uh, the article is available, you can see it there, it's open access and so you can follow up and criticise some of the things we've said if you so wish to. Thanks very much for joining us.